This is Bewilderbeasts, an infotainment show dedicated to inspiring curiosity for all ages by investigating the ways animals intersect at humanity. I am not a historian, an ethologist, a researcher, a scientist, a zoologist, a trained audio engineer, or an expert in, well, anything. Y'all, I'm lucky if I can remember to put my clean laundry in the dryer before it gets funky. And while I make every effort to present things as accurately as I can with a fun flair, I'm going to mess up. And that's okay. I hope I've given you a nice place to jump off from on your own adventures into curiosity. Or at the very least, I've given you the key to win your next round of trivia. Welcome to Bewilderbeasts. I'm your host, Melissa McHugh McGrath, still recording today from the tiniest podcast studio closet outside of Boston, Massachusetts. Today in Bewilderbeasts, we're going to talk about bugs who solve murders, a dog who wouldn't leave a grave after his owner was buried for 14 years, and using frog magic to save human lives. All right, let's go. I just wanted to give a quick shout out at the top to my friend, Miss Megan. Miss Megan has been the children's librarian at Somerville's East Branch Library for, well, at least the last eight years. The kids love her. But what Miss Megan always does is she's always engaging with families and she's always trying to make things better. And one of the initiatives that is really important to me is making sure that kids have access to books and reading. One of the ways that we've done that in our city was collecting books from our citizens, the citizens of Somerville, Massachusetts, on free cycle pages, buy nothing pages, people who were giving away books or cleaning out their bookshelves for kids, and a bunch of parent volunteers would drive around the city and pick up these books. And instead of a traditional book fair, where books might be a little too expensive for everyone to participate, we would give these books to kids at like a dollar a book if they could afford it. And if they couldn't afford it, just take the books. And at first, we weren't sure if this initiative was going to work. It's a fundraising adventure for most schools, their book fairs, but it also just felt horrible to watch kids just sit and color while very few kids would get up and go purchase books. So in working with people like Miss Megan and the other people of our community, we were able to collect the first year several thousand books that we were able to give and at selling them for about a dollar a book, we were able to make more money than we did with a traditional book fair because everybody was included. We were able to invite the entire community to come and get books. It was so heartwarming. And so when COVID hit, we ended up just collecting books the same way and just gave them to children. We drove our cars around the city. We would park at parks and in parking lots. We have a bookstore, All She Wrote Books, in Assembly Square in Somerville, who so graciously used the back storage for kids to come in and rifle through the books and just take a bag of books that they pick because it's been a horrible year. Um, Nothing has been normal for the kids of our city. And that was one way that we as parents were able to give back. And the books donations from the libraries really went in a way to help these kids get more books that were well-loved and interesting characters and diverse characters. It was so cool. So thank you, thank you, thank you to the librarians that have gotten us all through this horrible year. And if you get a chance, go and support your local library. Go in. It's not just books. They have the internet, of course, but they also have programs. Like Miss Megan gave us a to-go craft, so Ace was able to make these cool little cardboard clouds and, and string yarn through the bottom to make it look like rain. She had a couple of them, so we've put them all over the house. Um, we've done little Easter projects through the library, book reading programs through the library where they get a sticker or a tag or a pencil or a prize or whatever the thing is that they're doing that year. It's a great way to build community. And the other thing that Miss Megan did was she pulled three books for children that she thought that I would like for this show, and she was not wrong. Today's second segment on Gray Friars Bobby a dog that I kind of heard about in passing, but I didn't really get until studying for this and reading the little chapter on it in this children's book, was inspired by three books that Miss Megan gave me. So Miss Megan, 
Thank you so much. And to all you kids out there, if you're bored, go see what your local library is up to. I think you might find something magical. So way back in episode six, the exploding whale fail, we talked about a cat who solved a murder by comparing her fur and DNA to similar hairs on a coat found by Shirley Duguay, a Canadian woman who was killed by her estranged boyfriend. But DNA has come a long, long way since the 1990s. And it's a fascinating area of science. There are many specialties of forensics now, and we're going to cover just one branch in particular today, forensic entomology. And that's the study of bugs in death and in other legal cases. So when I was in high school, I was fascinated with the idea of forensics. I even did my chemistry project on forensics where you could just pour a liquid metal into a body and then pull out the replica of the murder weapon. It was very CSI, for better, for worse, as I'm sure every forensic scientist is so over CSI. But unfortunately, I did that project in the middle of nowhere, Maine, after my mom left town for the weekend. So I was 16 and all alone in a creaky house in the woods, writing about dead people and very graphic injuries. So let's just say I wish I had made a baking soda vinegar volcano like all the other kids instead. I'm pretty sure I didn't sleep for two whole days. But entomologists use bugs in many, many ways to solve cases. So for starters, the one that is frequently used on crime shows is to demonstrate a timeline by using the life cycle of bugs to determine maybe the time of death. So this will give investigators a place to start. And starting an investigation is very important. So let's say a fly laid eggs, but there's no larva. So then the time of death was much earlier than, say, if there were dead flies on the ground and lots of flies buzzing around and eggs and every stage of the life cycle of a fly. That would indicate maybe the eggs were laid by the flies, those flies died, then the eggs hatched and went through their entire life cycle, and that would indicate a longer timeline since the body was laid there. Another method in which insects can be used to help solve cases is location. There is a case in the San Diego Union Tribune that described a body found in the desert. And when police started their investigation, they collected insects from the body, like thinking that they were going to figure out a time of death by using the timeline method that I mentioned above. That seems reasonable. But what the entomologists ended up discovering from these bugs was that some of the bugs on the body were desert bugs, but some were from the city. And that meant that this person was killed in the city Some bugs landed on her, deposited eggs, which can take about 20 minutes. Or maybe these bugs just went along for the ride to the desert. Woohoo, road trip! Then the city bugs made some new desert bug friends, and this helps solidify when this person was killed and when she likely landed in the desert, which actually really helped with the timeline too. But by using this information, police were able to start their investigation in the city, which they wouldn't have done otherwise when they found her body in the desert. And it turns out this victim's business partner ended up killing her in a warehouse and then moved her body to the desert. You can run, but you can't hide from these bugs. So while these bugs might be creepy and crawly to some of you, I think that there is nothing cooler than them telling us these stories, bearing witness to the things that we prefer not to see. They help us solve the biggest puzzles out there. And they fight crime. One other method that entomologists will use in their quest to fight crime is ingested DNA from insects. So unlike the time of death, which is helpful to start an investigation, and unlike location determination, which also can help start investigation, DNA can point a finger and secure a case for investigators. And some bugs can do this. Now hear me out. Forensic entomologist Dr. Jason Bird tells a story about investigators who once tested blood on an axe. Ew. The investigators suspected that this axe was the murder weapon. So all they had to do was just get the DNA from the victim off of the blood of the axe. And that would be a great piece of evidence and it would help solve the case. But sadly, the test that came back was inconclusive, meaning they couldn't tell if this was or was not the victim. But the investigators had other helpers on the scene. 
thanks to some quick thinking of the entomologists on site, the ants that swarmed the bloody weapon had actually ingested some of the victim's DNA, and those ants protected the DNA, and this went on to save the case. So the next time you think, ew, a bug, ew, squish it, that bug might have actually solved a crime and deserves a little more respect. And if you thought this was cool, and it is, maybe, just maybe, you have a career in forensic entomology. And if not, stick to the baking soda volcanoes. One of the most sought-out gravestones in the world is not for a war hero, a king, or a singer. Okay, fine. Let's be real. Those are also probably popular places to check out, but for the sake of this story, just roll with it, right? This gravestone is of a Sky Terrier named Gray Friars Bobby, owned by a police officer named John Gray. Maybe. Others called him Old Jack. Spelled old as in A-U-L-D, old lang syne. Not old as in how AC has introduced me multiple times to her kindergarten class. But here's the thing. There are several versions of the Greyfriar Bobby's tale, and I'm going to let you figure out which one you prefer. Maybe I'll tell you my preference. Maybe you'll just be able to figure it out from the way I tell the stories. Maybe you can tell by my tone, my editing, my sarcasm. I don't know. We'll see. But I'm going to go in reverse order of the way that I have read all of these stories. The third version is that people see stray dogs in graveyards and they feed those dogs because they feel bad for the strays and wrongfully attribute homeless dogs in graveyards as those who are looking over the ghosts of their caretakers. Loyal to the end, this is such a great story. But it might be wrong. It's a very humanistic, optimistic, unscientific way of looking at such stories. Stories that happen all over the world. This dog is not special. And that over time, people coming to see these graveyard dogs, the dogs watching the dead, tugged at the heartstrings of people. Especially tourists. And maybe this wasn't intended. But it became a money-making scheme, an economically sound decision for cities to advertise these dogs the guardians of the dead. The second version is that there are two people in the story named John Gray. One is a farmer and one is a policeman. And that given how many people are named John in 1850 and Gray is a very common last name, this story could totally hold water. But there seems to be only one account of the two John Grays. And if this one account is told in a bar... And this account is that the dog lived and was owned by the barkeep with no other information to back that up. No one else ever saw this dog in the bar. The barkeep didn't have a dog. It's a little sus. There was an article written in the Scotsman in 1934, 60 years after Bobby the Sky Terrier's death from this one account. And here's the most common story. Once there was a night watchman named John Gray. He was a constable, a bobby, a police officer, however you want to think of him in 1850. And unlike in America where you're given a badge, a gun, and a taser, and a get-out-of-jail-free card, constables at the time had to have their uniform, good boots to walk on the cobble streets, and a dog. The dog was regulation. Constable Gray found himself a dog. A police work dog. A good working dog. A little six-month-old Sky Terrier he named Bobby which is a great name for a police dog in Scotland as a bobby is another name for police. It would be like if today's police named their dog Sarge or Major or Captain or Private, though honestly I'd stay away from the last one. And while most people wouldn't think of a Sky Terrier as a good police dog, they would think of a German Shepherd maybe or a Bloodhound or a Labrador or a Belgian Malinois, the dog on SEAL Team 6 who took out Osama Bin Laden, a Dutch Shepherd maybe, All big, solid, stoic working dogs with big noses or eyes that won't miss a thing. Don't even try it. But a Sky Terrier has these big radars for ears with a beautiful fringe that gracefully comes down and frames their faces. They are long bodied, soft coated, and while they're only 10 inches at the shoulder, shorter than a ruler, 
They're about 25 to 40 pounds, which is not much smaller than my 45-pound hound mix, Captain Love, who I would say would make a terrible police dog but an excellent PR agent for any outfit. Sky Terriers are tenacious and beautiful, and while they are stunning to look at, they do need a lot of upkeep on their coat. They were bred to hunt badger like their relatives, the Dachshunds, another badger fighting dog who is bred to use their long backs to get into holes in the ground, grab an angry badger by the face, and pull him out. Have you ever seen an angry badger? You don't want to, and you definitely don't want to pull them out by their face. But these dogs, they do, and they were the perfect undercover Bobby. They love people. They hate to be left alone, so all those walkies with their owner doing patrol in the streets? Perfect! They alert to danger. They can do damage if a badger's nearby, so I'm pretty sure they could hold their own against a criminal. But also in 1850s Scotland, pickpockets, thieves, murders, all sorts of things were going on in the darkness. As Edinburgh, Scotland was growing out of the rocks that surrounded the city, and they were the very foundation of this city. It was a harsh and stunning environment, and Bobby with his Bobby were going to stay busy. Bobby the dog was always by John the Bobby's side. They would stop for a meal together at the John Trail restaurant. They were well-known and well-respected. They were living a pretty simple life in the shadow of the castles of Edinburgh. But in 1857, two years into their relationship, Constable John developed a cough. And it started off as all coughs do, that dang tickle in your throat. They didn't have COVID-19 then, so just wait it out. They also didn't have antibiotics, so just wait it out. But he got sicker and sicker and sicker. And at the tail end of the winter of 1957, Constable John, the gardener who had become a beat cop because Scotland needed constables more than gardeners at the time, died of tuberculosis with Bobby, his beloved companion, at his side. But a dog isn't famous for 150 years if he just hung out with a cop dad who died. As Constable John Gray was laid six feet under in Greyfriars Kirkyard, which is another name for a graveyard, a place where all people like you or me could be buried at the time alongside royalty and the rich and the powerful, where they mingle in the afterlife at the weirdest ghost party ever, weirdly also had a no-dogs policy, but luckily Bobby the dog couldn't read. The story goes, the morning after Constable John Gray was buried at Greyfriars Kirkyard, the caretaker, James Brown, unlocked the gates to find a 10-inch Sky Terrier laying on the fresh dirt of his master's grave. And James is said to have felt terribly, but rules are rules, man, and dogs are dogs, and he shooed Bobby the dog away. As he did the next morning, and the next, and the next. And it mattered not if it was raining or sleeting or blistering sun— through hunger and thirst, Bobby laid on the grave of his only friend for 14 years. James would take the opportunity every day as the cannons announced the 1 p.m. lunch, like a grandfather clock or a school bell, to go to the bar and get food at John Trail's restaurant right behind the graveyard, the very place Constable John Gray and Bobby the Sky Terrier would dine in the alive times. James thought, well, maybe I could lure Bobby to live here at the restaurant instead. He could eat good food, he could see the graveyard, find people, be at peace. But no amount of greasy fries, pub nuts, and soggy burgers would move this little dog. So James did the next best thing. He ensured Bobby the Sky Terrier never went hungry. And as word got out, no doubt, when old-timey Scottish Karens in petticoats gasped and felt faint about a dog in the graveyard, but there are rules. With their old-timey crank cameras and the community banding together, they ended up overriding the petticoated Karens and built Bobby a shelter at the gravesite. They brought him food and treats and attention, but Bobby would not leave the spot. Bobby now lived at the graveyard, watching over his owner as his owner had watched over the city. But as the years ticked by, but the rules, dogs needed to be licensed within the city. And without an owner to pay the fee because everything costs money, Bobby was at a very real risk of being taken in by old-timey Scottish animal control, where he likely would have floundered, failed, flunked, and died even sadder than this story already is. But the Lord Provost Sir William Chambers, 
He was a publisher who came up from poverty and built an educational book empire which still exists today under the name of Chambers Harrop Publishing, LTD. Lord Provost was also a crucial piece on the Reform Act of 1867, which doubled the voting population of Wales and England. Oh no, silly, not by letting women vote. Women still weren't considered people yet. No, they ended up expanding voting rights to people, men, who were working class in England and in Wales. So it's better, but still not great, but better. So Lord Provost Sir William Chambers, all around a stand-up guy for the time, ponied up the money to license Bobby the Sky Terrier. A dog, if you were to see today, would have been mangy and dirty and matted, a hot mess of a dog laying in the graveyard, a mutt, a stray, a feral beast, who was really a dog who never, ever recovered from the loss of his friend and ended up getting everything he needed brought to him as he lay on the grave of his dead master for 14 years. And when Bobby the Sky Terrier died in 1872, with his special collar in the words, Grey Friars Bobby from the Lord Provost, 1867, licensed. Probably it was worn down over the decades, plus he lived in the graveyard alone and hopefully not lonely. He was laid to rest not far from his only true friend in life, Constable John Grey in Grey Friars Kirkland, Scotland, in 1872. Greyfriars Bobby, yes his name, but also tipping his hat to the little constable or Bobby of Greyfriars Graveyard. This little dog not only watched over John Grey, he watched over all of his jurisdiction, as a good Bobby would do. A statue still stands in this little dog's honor outside the gates of the graves where tourists like to come, use their Insta things or face chats and camera phones to document their stay, that they say that this little statue of the little loyal lap dog for a larger lap. But some will leave trinkets for Bobby the dog too. Bones, flowers, sticks, notes of love and adoration. And his story, whether you believe it's real or hyperbole or a drunken fueled state or an inkling of hope in an impossible year, has led to several pop culture references. There was a dog in an episode of Futurama that makes me cry every single time I watch it where Fry, the main character, goes forward in time, hence the future part of Futurama. But his beloved dog waited and waited and waited for him to come back to the pizza shop where he worked, and the dog ended up dying there in front of the shop. In video games like Red Dead Redemption 2 and Grand Theft Auto V, a dog sits next to his owner's grave. It's a nice little Easter egg for gamers. And of course, you know me, I cannot not talk about Terry Pratchett's reference. Gaspode the Wonder Dog is my favorite character in the Discworld series who famously said, I speak in dog, but you only listen in human. And he has an arc similar to the Grey Friars Bobby, howling at his owner's final resting place. But it wasn't out of sadness or longing despair, as most of the passerby thought. His tail was trapped under the gravestone. There is a superstition that is common among many historical markers that if you rub the marker in such a way or touch it in the right place or kiss it or interact with it in a particular manner, it will bring you good luck. In this case, rubbing the tip of Greyfriars Bobby Nose is thought to bring you good luck, but it's less good luck for this statue. The nose has a protective coating that has been worn down due to people rubbing off the luck, which is really just Nihilic clear coat for statues. So if you go, go and look at the statue. Try not to touch it, as tempting as it is. Leave a stick or a bone or a note in his honor and think about which version you think is true. A shout out to Haley who sent me a story by way of the Instagram account. So if you have a story idea, do send it in. There are many ways, and we will cover those at the end of the show. But Haley suggested discussing wood frogs who survive winter by essentially converting liquid in their blood into sort of an antifreeze. This is the same stuff that we have to put in our cars to keep them from freezing in the winter. So we'll get back to the wood frog and some of his buddies in a minute. But first, we need to talk about why scientists are looking at these animals to begin with. 
I have a special designation on my driver's license that says, if I die in an accident, please donate my organs to someone who needs them. My heart can help someone. My eyes, my kidneys, my body can go on to help other people who are sick. But it's a process, one that has to go really fast and with the utmost delicacy, as human organs cannot survive very long without being, well, in a human. So let's say I am a perfect match for a person who needs a new heart in California, but I'm in Boston. And even on a plane and kept on ice, the heart would never make it. A human heart with our current technology, knowledge, and ability is only able to survive outside of a host for about four to five hours. It would probably actually still be stuck in a cooler in the American Airlines security line when the clock runs out. So as a result of this, many people on organ donation sites need donors who are closer, and they need to go right now if an organ becomes available. Are you a teacher who needs a kidney transplant? You gotta leave class. Are you a truck driver? You have to turn around. Are you a mom? I hope you have a babysitter on standby because that new heart isn't gonna wait. Many organs can't get to the person in time meaning lots of organs have to be discarded because there's no match nearby and no way to keep the organ from dying en route. But we are able to keep some parts of our body alive. We can keep egg and sperm, two very freezable cells that we use all the time when we want to save eggs for future pregnancies or for sperm egg donation. Why can't we do this with larger organs? Well, sperm and eggs are each one cell. And when those cells combine, you have the building blocks of a baby. And those two cells start to multiply real fast. Nine months later. But those are single cells. Embryos and stem cells also qualify under this small-scale, freezable operation. It takes some special sauce, a chemical called cryoprotectorants, basically a way to keep ice from forming and damaging cell membranes and killing the cells. So let's look at it this way. A heart is millions of cells, and there is water between these cells, and that's where the problem is. See, when water freezes, it expands. It gets bigger. And the space between the cells, now with frozen water, gets damaged. It also creates a pressure difference, and those cells die. Now with that context, let's look back at our wood frog friend. The wood frog needs to survive winter, and he does this by partially freezing on purpose. Water flows out of the organs like I discussed above with the human heart example. But that water forms into a protective layer of ice, not a kill the organ and destroy it layer of ice that we have. As this happens, the frog's body builds up urea. That's in your pee. And glucose. That's in a pixie stick. And it acts like antifreeze. This new internal frog juice ew, will wash over the organs and keep the heart, the kidneys, and all internal organs from freezing. Then the frog just plays dead. They freeze for the entire winter. And what caught Haley's eye is that they basically are thawing out right now, waking up right as rain. But ask any suburban dad. Winterizing, no matter if it's a house, a car, get those studded tires on before the first frost, or if you're a frog getting ready to turn into a frogsicle, this is a process. A long process and a series of very complicated steps. So couldn't we just take their anti-freezing agents out of their body? Well, no. One, that might kill our frog friend, and we don't want to do that. Also, this frog juice ew, is toxic to some other species, which will make it very hard to study a direct relationship. But we can do what's called biomimicry. That's taking something that exists in nature, like this frog juice, and finding inspiration to create our own things that does a similar function. You have used biomimicry, really. If you've ever seen an airplane fly overhead or have been in one, that was inspired by birds. The Wright brothers were inspired by pigeons especially, and while our planes currently don't go flap, 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 
They did. The bullet train in Japan. It's based on a bird's beak. Aerodynamics, baby. Velcro. Yo, Velcro is a direct result of sticky burrs and other seeds that hook onto animals' fur and your pants. Shark skin. That influenced swimming suits. So, scientists at the University of Warwick in the UK have successfully created a synthetic version of this antifreeze that could maybe help save human organs. Scientists are still looking closely at fish who have this antifreezing agent and in other animals, frogs that we talked about today, the alligators from a few weeks ago. They want to see if there's something there that we can use to help us get these organs to humans. Humans who have been waiting on long lists for a match. So stay tuned. So as always, thank you for joining me today on Bewilder Beasts. If you like this podcast, please share and tell your friends. It's truly the best way to support the show. If there are topics you'd be interested in hearing about on the podcast, know of any historical animals who changed the world, animals who help humans, other animals who help solve cold cases, or wacky animals in the news, please, there are multiple ways to send them in or let me know what you think of the show. Email bewilderbeastpod at gmail.com. Tweet at Bewildered Pod, DM or voice text on Bewilderbeast Pod on Facebook, or lurk at Bewilderbeasts on Instagram. I'm Melissa McHugh McGrath, co training director of the New England Dog Training Club, author of Considerations for the City Dog, and creator of this podcast. Now go get curious. I got today's information regarding forensic entomology from the University of Florida's Entomology and Nematology Department and the San Diego Tribune on Greyfriars Bobby, atlasobscura.com, introducing edinburgh.com, findagrave.com, and this book, thank you, Miss Megan, for giving it to me, Animal Stories, Heartwarming True Tales from the Animal Kingdom, written by Jane Yolen with her kids, Heidi, Adam, and Jason Stemplo and beautiful illustrations by Joy Ashida. And frog juice from Breakthroughs.com on how antifreeze works and how osmosis works. And youmatter.world and wiki books on structural biochemistry because I really needed a lot of help with that one. Links, as always, are in the description of today's episode. Intro music is Tiptoe Out the Back by Dan Leibowitz and interstitial music is by MK2. Any other music is in today's show notes. Don't forget to like and subscribe, review, and please share with your curious friends. You know, all the things that every other podcast tells you to do. Thanks so much for listening, and I will see you next week. (laughs) 